Well, good afternoon, everyone, and it is a pleasure to be with you this afternoon, Monday, January the 30th, starting at 2.05 today in our class on the government of the United hello. States. Good, hello. Hello. Uh, what we will be doing today is talking about the Constitution, some of the uh, underpinnings of the Constitution, what led to it. Uh, hopefully that at this point you have uh, read the material in your uh, textbook and have uh, looked over the Constitution itself. I would encourage you to also look at your course site and on Canvas and look carefully at the elements of the unit that we're on, which is our first unit on the Constitution and the, uh, the, the uh, foundations of our country based on the Constitution and what led up to the Constitution. Uh, you'll note that I have uh, various sets of notes for you already written. Uh, I also have re review material for you to work on and study. Uh, it, it, it's not all up yet, but a lot of it, is, but some material is. Uh, just know that throughout the course, I will, I will have material for you to assist you in your studies. But there's nothing more important for you than reading your assigned material from your online uh, textbook and from uh, any of the material that I've published. Because I'll be writing the tests and I'll be pulling information from that on the exam. But I try to make it accessible for you. And at any point in the course that you, uh, you, you have difficulty finding information, don't hesitate to write me. Don't hesitate to send a message to me. Uh, I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can. Uh, I'll even set up a meeting with you uh, if you, you need assistance. But uh, let me know how I can help you. But the most important thing you can do to help yourself is to read everything that is assigned to you. To make your own notes as you read. Uh, there's something about that whole uh, 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 set of circumstances where you read something, but then you take what you've read and put it in your words and translate it to a piece of paper or your computer screen. And it'll uh, make little engrams in your brain that will be able to be accessed when you're working on your exams and things of that nature. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, we're looking at today the Constitution of the United States and what what led us to it in the early days of our, our, our government and some of the foundations of the Constitution. Uh, the Constitution is was originally consisting of just seven articles that laid out the basic structure and basic laws of the government. It established the United States as a strong federal republic composed of three branches of government. And I'm betting everybody here knows those three branches of government, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial branch. And over a period of time, the Constitution has been amended to account for the growth of the nation, the changing uh, aspects of technology and uh, the growth of the country, and changes to the political system over the past couple of hundred years of the existence of this country. But the 
glue that has held it together was the idea that our founding fathers had of creating a government that was adaptable, that provided for the rights of individual citizens and provided for grievances to be heard and a system to where states operated under a national government where you had a unified nation, but you had individual states with their own set of laws as well as the national laws. The national laws, where we find them, the basic underpinning, the basic foundation of it all is right here in the Constitution. So let's get started a little bit on talking about the Constitution and the origins of the Constitution. You can really look at the at, at the Declaration of Independence in 1776 as one of the uh, precursors to the Constitution where the founders of the new nation listed grievances against the King of England because they were they were subjects of their uh, of that government, the English government, as led by a king. Uh, we don't, they didn't, rather. They didn't elect a king. A king was not elected by the people. Who appointed the king? Well, according to the king and uh, the system of government of that kind, uh, God appointed the king. He, 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 he led by a divine right that said that the king has uh, authority over all people in the, in the government. Well, we, us folks who came over from England and our other countries were not really fond of the idea as, as, as we became independent thinking people who wanted to make our own government and said, no, 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 no. We're not going to have a king over here in the, this country here in America. In fact, we left England. We left our home countries overseas so that we could have greater freedoms and make our own rules and have our own government and control the government ourselves. You know, you, you, you and I put the guys and gals that run our country into office. Uh, we vote for the type of government that we want to have and the people that we want in. Not, uh, it's not forced on us. It's not uh, expected that, oh, well, uh, I, I have the right to do this no matter what the people say. No, the people give the rights to the people who are in office by voting them in. And they just vote them out in the next election. That is a constitutional form of government where we, the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish these laws, establish these constitutional rights. And I have a black and white dog that's saying, yes, yes, I agree with that, Daddy. Yeah, I, I, as, as a black and white dog, I re represent the freedom of all people, no matter what color, black and white. Uh, I got them both right here on me. Uh, we're very fortunate. I, I, I consider my, myself extremely fortunate to be an American citizen. Um, and we have a good government. I, I, you turn on the news, you might sometimes think, wow, we got a lousy government. There's some bad people up there in Washington, or there's some bad people in Austin. Uh, or there may be some bad people down at City Hall. Well, whose fault is that then? In a democracy where we have the constitutional right to elect the people into the offices, it's our fault if we elect the wrong people. But guess what? We're going to have another election. We can correct that by voting those sorry 
folks out of office and putting good people in. All of this founded on principles from 200 years ago under the Declaration of Independence, under the Constitution of the United States, and, and coming from ideas of philosophers that talked about freedom of thought and freedom to control our own destinies. Uh, we, the, the people that of hundreds of years ago can't imagine, could not imagine the kind of freedoms that we have because they were under the impression that, well, we're here ruled by a king, we're here and the king was appointed by God, so if we want to, if we want something, we have to depend on the, the grat, uh, uh, gratis, the, 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 the generosity of the king in providing protection or uh, uh, resources for us. It's not us making those decisions. It's one person that supposedly God put into the position of authority. Well, we broke from that uh, because we lived under the ideas of certain philosophers uh, that uh, were carried over here and, and, and we really took hold of like, like the idea of natural rights. Uh, Take, for instance, the philosophy of John Locke, that rights are derived from people's basic moral sense that supersedes the authority of any government. Natural rights, according to this idea of, of, from the philosophy of John Locke, was that the power is not vested in the hands of a king, is the theory behind the divine right of kings would say. But the power to control our destiny is given to each individual directly by God, including the right to life, to liberty, and to, well, if you look at the documents of our founding, you've heard life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, what um, Locke would say that the natural rights were the right to life, liberty, and property. Uh, you get to own property. Back then, all the property prior to uh, essentially uh, we developing our own rights to control our own destiny, the, the all property belonged to a king. And if you lived somewhere, you lived under the gracious gift of a king who controlled your destiny. And you didn't put him there. Supposedly, God put him there by a divine right that was given to a king. We did away with that. And so we decided that life, liberty, and property were the rights of individuals in governing themselves. So a government's legitimate only was part of this philosophy if the people approved of it, if they consented to it. In other words, the people formed a contract with a government of their own creation, it's a, a social contract with this government. We'll turn over some of our rights to a government that we have established. And we are trusting the government that we have created. We are trusting the government to whom we have placed people through an election into power over us to make the decisions that will benefit us because we've put them there and we can vote them out. No, God didn't put them there. We put them there through our votes. No, it wasn't a divine right of kings that put them into power. The president of the United States, States has not been put in office because of God's authority to say, oh, the president of the United States is going to be Donald J. Trump or whomever may be the case. No, it's the people of the United States. The people can make very good decisions. Sometimes they can make some very 
bad decisions about who they put into office. But it's our decision. And if we see that the person that we put into office makes some terrible, horrible mistakes, they ain't going back. We ain't going to put them back in office. That's our authority. That's our power under this system of the rights of individuals to make decisions through political processes under this new form of government. Uh, a government under an idea of the consent of the governed uh, is legitimate only if the people approve of it, if they consent to, to it. It's a kind of a contract. It's a social contract between the people and the people that we put in office to represent us and work for us. The government is not all powerful, although if we were living under a king, the king is all powerful because he could say, off with that person's head because I don't like him and I'm the king and I was put into this office, not by the votes of the people, by what? Instead, God put me here. I rule by the divine right of kings. Whoa. Does that sound right to you? Of course not. You're an American. You understand freedom. You understand you have rights. Of course, as we've seen, sometimes those very rights are violated by the people who hold authority over us, as we've seen in the most dramatic of fashion with the murder of the young man recently on the streets of Memphis by police officers, by the government, by government representatives. However, in the divine right of kings, the king's men could do that without any recourse. Oh, well, hey, I'm the king. These are my, these are my uh, operatives. And if they are working, they're working under my divine right of being the king. And so they get to do whatever they want to. No, we don't look at it that way. The police officers who killed the young man recently in Memphis were working for the government. But guess what? They will probably be serving time in prison because they've been charged, police officers, with murder. They will be tried for the murder of that young man in Memphis. Whoa, the government's going to allow that? Yes, because the government represents the reflection of what the people have placed the responsibility in the hands that we have created a position of authority and we're not going to allow it because we write the law. We write the law through our elected officials and those people that we put into power to exercise the enforcement of the law, like the police, they've got to obey that same law. They don't have the power. Oh, well, I work for the king so I can do anything I want to. Well, uh, maybe a couple hundred years ago, but not now. Not now. Uh, a government's only as powerful as that which power is given to them by the people. So a government's legitimate only if the people approve of it or consent to it. Again, that's the social contract. And because natural rights, rights supposedly given to each individual, correctly, uh, because natural rights are superior to a government. Governments have limited power over us. And one of the responsibilities of a government is to protect us and protect our property and our lives. Anyway, uh, the English law that we lived in in the early days of the country lived under the law of the divine right of kings and the king could do everything but an american revolution ended that and we created our own democracy where we are going to find a way of running our own government 
and put the hands in the power of the people and the elected representatives that we, the people, vote in, not a king appoints to run based on his individual wishes. The American Revolution, breaking away from England, ends in 1783, and we form a new government and directly make changes that affect the creation of a new government and the activities of a uh, democracy. A democracy where the people make the decisions, where the people create the government and the government's responsive to the needs and interests of the people who put the people in office. Uh, our first national governing document was not our constitution. Our first national governing document was the Articles of Confederation which established the first government of the United States with its enactment, the Articles of Confederation in 1781. And it was essentially designed to protect individual states' independence, that there would be no national government telling the states what they had to do, that, that we would be a nation made up of individual states with an overarching national government but that states had rights of ruling its people just as much as the national government had to control the government of the nation as a whole. Uh, however, you do have to have a centralized government if you're going to have a nation per se, otherwise you could have you know, 50 individual states doing whatever the heck they wanted to, much to the uh, oh, disagreement with the next door state, perhaps. Texas can do a heck of a lot by making their own state laws, but they can't infringe on any of the rights of neighboring Louisiana. Why? Because we have a nation as a whole where we protect the rights of individual states to make their own decisions, but we do not infringe on other states from one state to the next. But the national government does make a unifying force with our national government. Uh, let's look at the national government under the Articles of Confederation. We did have a Congress, per se, a national legislature. Now, by the way, the do we have do we have a national legislature today? Yeah, it's called what? Anybody know? Anybody know what our national governing body is? Congress. 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 Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Absolutely, the national governing body is Congress made up of representatives from the individual states, delegates to Congress, elected to represent the people and the states. Uh, and by the way, uh, our, our, our first Congress was a unicameral body. What do I mean by unicameral body? Well, what's uh so uh, only one body only so, one body. so while we have like the the senate and the uh, house of representatives there was only one not not two exactly see our current congress our congress that was created under the constitution of the united states is a bicameral legislative body in other words it's made up of two chambers two separate chambers why why would we have two chambers why not just have one well, because look at the, again, the unique nature of the country. We're a, we're a united country, but we're made up of individual states. And the Congress reflects that. We elect members to the House of Representatives and we elect delegates to the United States Senate. Well, what's the difference between the two? 
the members of the House of Representatives strongly represent the state from which they come. But they represent the people of the state, in particular, the area from which they're from. In other words, we divide the state in the House districts, U.S. House districts, and we elect a U.S. representative from the Sugar Land area, from Central Texas, from Deep West Texas, from East Texas, from the districts of that the Texas the Texas is divided into in their U.S. House districts. But I mean, we're a big state, so we probably have more U.S. senators than, uh, say, Louis, little old Louisiana, right? No. How many U.S. senators do we have, even though we're bigger than Louisiana? Two, like everyone else. Two, like everybody else. Why? Because the United States Senate represents the state itself. Because the United States Senate is made up of senators, two from each of the states. And that's why you have 100 senators. Because how many states do we have? We have 50 states, two from each state right now. We, oh, some people, there, there are many who would like to make Puerto Rico, which is a U.S. territory, uh, a state. I don't know, it's been long talked about, but it hadn't happened yet, and I don't know if it'll ever happen. But if it did, we would have a United States Senate made up of, uh, of 102 members, because each state would have two United States Senators. Yeah, gosh, why all this differentiation? Because we break apart the power so that no one force, no one group holds absolute control over the government like a king would. So you've got 100 senators making decisions for the nation. And then you have 435 members of the U.S. House of Representatives making decisions for the nation as a whole, in particular the people directly in their states. Wow. Seems very complex. I worked in Congress for several years. I was the press secretary for a U.S. congressman. And uh, for a while, uh, when I first went up there, I went up there as a uh, 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 student assistant. Uh, uh, well, the my dad knew the congressman, which is why a lot of young people get into an office working for a congressman because dad knew your son. My son's a sharp guy, and and I know the congressman. So I'm gonna talk to him and say, "My boy needs to come up there and learn how Washington works because he's real interested in politics." And so, yeah, well, we'll send him up there. Is he smart? Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, good. You you could. Probably go to work for Congress if you wanted to give it a shot, because they're always looking for a smart person who likes politics. But so I go up there and work in his office, but he appointed me to work in the House of Representatives as a doorkeeper. In other words, I had to uh, work uh, to know who all 435 members of the House of Representatives were because I was assigned to the speaker's door, which was right off the uh, the back of the, going to the back, behind the speaker's podium at the front of the U.S. House of Representatives, there's a speaker's chamber in the background where people sit and talk and, 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 and meet and uh, speaker goes back there and meets with people. 
I, I had to know all 435 members of Congress by their face and names and match them. And so they could not, uh, yeah, so that, uh, well, I'm sorry, sir, but uh, right now it's closed off because the speaker is back here working and you know, that sort of thing. Uh, then I went to work uh, in the office also as his press, as a congressman's press secretary. Uh, why? Because one of the, uh, because I've been a reporter at a television station and been a newspaper reporter also while I was going to college uh, for the local newspaper in Waco. I went to Baylor. And I was a journalism major and a political science major. And someone's mowing the yard in the backyard, so it's <laughs> a little bit on the loud side if you can hear the the mower. Oh, they're off the oh, patio. Oh, she's, mad. They're, they're pressure washing also, so. <laughs> okay, no one can hear it good. That's good. That's very good. Okay. Uh, the whole idea about Congress is it is the most representative body. You have, you have access to the person who is the, your representative in Congress. If you have a problem, if you are interested in something, all you have to do is pick up the phone and call your congressman's office. Say, for instance, if grandma has not been getting her social security check, you just pick up your phone and call the congressman's office and say, uh, could I speak to the congressman? Well, the congressman's busy and he's back in Washington, but there's a whole bunch of us folks who work on his staff that are here to help you. And any problems you have, we'll take to the congressman and we will take care of the problem on behalf of you at the direction of the congressman. So what's the problem? Well, grandma's not been getting her social security check. She's gone to the show social security office and she had to wait for hours and hours and still didn't get anybody to help her worth a damn. And this isn't right. She needs her paycheck. She needs a social security check and they've screwed it up and the local office hasn't been helped us. Can you help us? Well, as a matter of fact, that's my job to help you. Because guess what? Where does Social Security's, the Social Security Agency in government, where do they get their money to pay for their people? Where do all those people that work there get their paycheck from? From Congress. Congress has the power of the purse. Congress controls the money. Congress makes the budget. Oh, yeah, the president has to sign the budget. The president suggests a budget to the Congress, but it's up to Congress to create the federal budget. And there are, they're constantly working on a budget. And so are the agencies that are asking for money because they will have people going to Congress and saying, please take care of this because we have the responsibility of taking care of these people. And when I, as working in the office of the congressman, gets a call saying Social Security is not taking care of the checks. What do I do? Send me that information, sir, and I will get on it like ugly on a monkey. So what do I do? I call Washington. I call the Social Security Congressional Liaison Office and say, I have, on behalf of my congressman, I'm calling you because one of our constituents has not been able to get her social security check, no matter how hard she's been trying. And I need your department here, the Congressional Liaison <laughs> Office, to in, involve yourself in this and make sure that the local office gets off their butt and take care of it. Now, why does social security take from its budget a whole bunch of money to hire people to talk to members of Congress's staff about problems their constituents are having or those people that they represent and then call them about a problem. 
why are they going to why do they worry about that hey listen we're busy taking care of our business do i need to remind you where you get your paycheck from from what congress allocates to social security <laughs> Maybe we ain't going to make a raise for you people next year if you don't take care of business, okay? In other words, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. You don't take care of our back and our constituents' backs, we'll bleed you. <laughs> we won't fund you. We'll cut your pay. Oh, we don't want that. By the way, politics... <laughs> Politics, by the way, is nothing more than you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. We'll all work together to take care of ourselves, but we also take care of the people that we represent if we're elected officials. And you ought to know from right now on that when you need help, you can get it. You can get it. And by the way, I would encourage you to go to work for your local congressman. I would encourage you to work on their campaign for office. Not only would you maybe get to go to Washington and work in the office and learn about how money is made and where the power is, and maybe you want to get involved in that for your own future, but from the standpoint of, hey, if I learn how power works, well, maybe I want to be involved in politics. Here's a little hint for you as well. You could volunteer right now for someone's campaign for Congress. You can volunteer to work as a uh, as a person who just stuffs envelopes in the congressman's office or in their campaign office. And why would you want to do that? Well, one night while you're working there on a Saturday night and all of your friends are out drinking and partying and having a great time and you're sitting there stuffing envelopes for the congressman or the person running for office in this, their congressional campaign office. And on Friday night, the, after the guy's out been campaigning, he comes back to the office, talks to the staff, and also all the businessmen and women who are giving big campaign contributions because they want this guy elected so that they will be able to have influence over him, and they give him big campaign contributions. They're down there talking to him about what needs to be done on the campaign and where we can help you raise money. And they see some kid like you, like you, like you, sitting in there stuffing envelopes on a Friday or a Saturday night. And that businessman who, you know, maybe Elon Musk is opening up an office in Houston and then he's down there working, visiting with a congressman saying, you know, I'm thinking about buying East Texas or something, you know, putting in a huge plant to build missiles or something or another, or build missiles that people can buy and fly around in, whatever. I'm Elon Musk. I don't think of something that's amazing and make a lot of money out of it. He sees you when he's walking out with the staff or the congressman, sees you working at nine o'clock at night on a Friday night when everybody else is out getting drunk and partying and everything. Who is that girl? Who is that young girl? Who is that young man? And they're here on a Friday night when they could be out partying. Those people, that, that person's pretty damn de dedicated, pretty damn serious about doing the, doing something for their lives. And guess what that person, Elon Musk maybe, might do? He'll probably walk over and say, hi, my name's Elon Musk. I don't know if you ever heard of me, but if you haven't, you need to know who I am because I'm somebody. Because I'm, I'm damn rich and damn powerful, but I'm damn impressed with you. Because most of your friends are probably out just having a damn good time tonight. That's just good, too. But you know that right now, the more you plan to get ahead, the more money you'll make, the more influence you'll have, and the better your life will be. 
That's smart. I like smart people. Here's my card. You looking for a job? I got jobs that pay well, and I like smart people working for me. Come see me. You might hire me? Yeah. Where else would you meet somebody like that unless it was in politics? Trust me. Trust me. You could meet somebody like that if you were involved in politics. Let me shut that down. That's, that, that's part of politics. Anyway. And if you know how politics works and you know how the government works, you're going to be of value to people in a job. Anyway. Uh, under our national government, under the Articles of Confederation, let's go back to that for just a moment. It was a unicameral national legislature, no executive or legislative institutions. Most of the powers back then rested with state legislatures. The government, the national government, didn't have a power to tax. There was no regulation of foreign or interstate power, of interstate trade under the Articles of Confederation. There was no national currency, no national defense. There were significant weaknesses under our first government under the Articles of Confederation. There was no unifying national force. Uh, and without the power to, for instance, collect taxes, the national government had few financial resources to pay its war debts, to do anything even. So the development of a national economy was inhibited by the government's inability to establish and regulate trade and to control a national budget. The Articles did not have and provide the authority for a national government to create a unified nation out of a collection of independent states which had different political, economic, and social concerns. So you had consequences from this. For instance, you may have read about Shays Rebellion. Well, Shays Rebellion was when uh, the uh, there are a number of people that refuse to pay debts, that refuse to pay uh, uh, and, and uh, their taxes. And the government had no power to raise a militia to enforce it. This was a, well, the government realized, uh, guys, we don't have the power to enforce the laws that we have, to collect taxes, to collect money that's owed to the government. Uh, Shays Rebellion, the farmer, farmers that said, no, no, we're not going to pay this. We're not going to pay the, these fees that you're asking. They were, we're not going to pay these taxes. When they tried, when the government tried to collect it, they fought them with weapons. The government said, oh, we got we to gotta do something to stop this. And so in 1786 at Annapolis, Maryland, the Annapolis Convention, the government attempted to suggest reforms of the Articles of Confederation, but it decided instead to ask Congress to schedule a convention and to start all over again. So in 1787 and Philadelphia, at the Constitutional Convention, we decided to make a new constitution. And there were a lot of hotly de 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 debated issues in the writing of this new constitution. In effect, the framers of this new constitution faced an enormous task of defining the nature of government as they felt that we needed to do. Uh, they did, however, agree on some basic principles that the government should check the self-interest of the people, yet protect their individual liberties and advance natural rights, such as equality. That factions, oh, I believe, we believe this, and this way we're going to approach it. Uh, this faction believes just the opposite, and we're going to work to control these goals and do these things. 
these various factions shouldn't be allowed to create political conflict and undermine the government. So no one faction should have the opportunity to prevail over the other. They could cooperate and find some common ground some places. And in order to protect government from a the will of a majority alone, the president of the United States, and we decided that we would have that office, a president would be chosen not by the people directly, but by an electoral college. And under the 17th Amendment in 1913, senators would be chosen by state legislatures, not directly by the people. Senators would be chosen by state legislatures until the 17th, excuse me, until the 17th Amendment in 1913. Senators were chosen by state legislatures, not directly by the people. James Madison had proposed that the national government be divided into three branches, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial, each branch having its own powers and responsibilities. And there'd be a system of checks and balances that would ensure that no one branch would be more powerful than the other. The majority or the minority might be able to take control of any one branch for a period of time, but not necessarily the whole political system. Didn't want control in just one set of hands. We wanted to spread control. We wanted to spread the opportunity for everyone to be heard and everyone to have a say in all of the various factions to have a chance to make a an impact on what government would be doing. So, uh, we established a federal system of government, a national system of government, which allowed power to be shared between the national government and the state governments. As you sit here today, you are being provided services by the national government and the state of Texas. You are being controlled by the laws of the state of Texas, but also by the laws of the United States of America. Uh, you're out of 7-Eleven. Please don't do that. I don't recommend it. 7-Eleven. Uh, they're not going to sell you a big gulp if you go in and rob them in ever again. So that I, I could never rob a 7-Eleven. I'm I, couldn't be without my big gulp. Uh, the, the, we, would, we would provide for you being able to have a right to make a decision as to uh, how to uh, operate under the political system federal government allowing power to be shared between the national and state levels of government. Checks and balances. Let's talk about checks and balances. Any questions? Any comments? Problems? That sort of thing? No, no questions, sir. No questions? No, no sir. Question? Yes, Kyle? No, sir, I do not have a question. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, no question. Okay. By the way, we do this for an hour. Do we do this? For, I think an hour is good. A good start for the. Yeah, for yeah, an hour is good. Okay, <laughs> Henry's going. Yeah, an hour. That's enough. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hungry. All right. <laughs> That's that's good. Uh, you have the right to write me anytime you need help. And I encourage you to exercise that right. And I will respond as soon as I possibly can when you have any questions and to assist you in any way I possibly can in getting this down and doing well in this class. If you make an A, you make me happy. And I will help you get to that A if I can. 
And so stay in touch with me. Please read the notes I have provided you. Please read the assigned chapters. Uh, give yourself the opportunity to learn and by listening to the news as to what's going on with our national government right now. There's a lot of interesting things constantly happening. I would encourage you to watch MSNBC. I would encourage you to watch CNN. I'd encourage you to read the New York Times for political news. Uh, I have the, the Houston Community College Library used to provide free access to the New York Times, which is the best newspaper in the country and covers Washington better than just about any other newspaper in the country other than perhaps the Washington Post itself. But be that as it may, they don't provide the, the, the New York Times any longer uh, free access to the for students. I myself would recommend, and don't tell them I said this, but recommend that maybe if you are interested in reading the New York Times, which by the way, when you're writing a research paper for me, you will need to do research, and I would recommend no paper, just discussion questions this semester. Right, right, yeah. Well, still in all, I would, I'd recommend you be able to read the New York Times. And so if you ever check with the library for something, say, by the way, I understand we used to get the New York Times and we could access it. Can we not have that? Gee, everybody in my class wants, in government class, wants to read it and understand that HCC used to do that. Please bring it back. They may listen to you. They may not. But uh, give it a shot if you ever get a chance to talk to them. Be nice, though. Be nice. Okay. And stay in touch. You holler at me if you need something, and I will talk to you in another couple of days. Okay. We'll we'll meet again soon. All right. All right. Bye, Mr. Professor. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Have Thank a good you. Day. Stay dry. Stay Thank you, Professor. Thank, Thank you, Professor. Professor. Nice to be with you. Take care. Thank Bye -bye. you, Professor. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. You're very welcome. See you later. And I'll publish this um, for you. Let's have a question. question yes, ma'am. What's your question? Oh, for since you said um, you haven't um, assigned the the workbook for the for the you know, long exam, correct? So you're gonna like post on Canvas, right, or on modules? Uh, yes. Okay. All, all, all that will be up on Canvas for you. Okay, so okay, so so you're gonna like post them on um, the you know, exam on for you for the new exam to us uh, to complete. I'm sorry, I didn't quite slow down there a little bit. I didn't quite. So you say you're gonna like um post the the worksheet for the for the um the unit one exam. Right. Canvas? Right. Okay. Yeah, for for every one of your exam, I'll I'll have there there's material for you to help you. Okay. And you said, um, so you say you want us to like to read the, I mean, read the notes and um, that 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 you provided us. Yeah, there. Let me tell you, here's, I don't do a lot of make work things for you to do, little games to play. Mm -hmm. I believe that God gave you a brain. You know how to read, and there is no better way to learn than to read, 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 read. So you need to read your textbook, and when you're reading your textbook, have a pen, have a pencil, I'm whatever, and piece and and take take notes on it. That's what I've been doing. I've been taking notes for the chapters. For Good for you. I'm so proud of you. Congratulations. You keep yeah. it up. Thank you. you keep it up. Have a and great. and so have a great day, and let me know if I can help you. Okay. Okay. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Anybody else? All right. See you later. Take care. I'm going to shut it down now and I'll look forward to hearing from you again and we'll look forward to meet again soon. Bye bye.